Oh, I have questions for you too. Like why Spain? But yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Where in Spain? Uh, I live in Andalusia in a town called Ronda, which is close to Sevilla and uh, in southern Spain. It was the second to last town to fall to the in the Reconquista. It fell in 1485 from the Moors to the Christians. And mm -hmm. that's where I live. So I've been here for five years. We were just going to come for an adventure in 2015. And then like we were going to stay a year or so. And then, I don't know, things in the U.S. kind of blew up. And we thought, oh, let's just hang out. Let's just stay. I was on my way there. I was going to stay three months this last summer oh, until the Rona hit. Right. I was learning Spanish online with this gal, uh, Pilar, uh, two hours north of Madrid. Okay. And then a COVID hit, and so it derailed all my plans. Yeah. So I'm envious. Wow. Where were you going to go? I wasn't quite sure. I hadn't finished the Camino de Santiago yet, so I thought I could incorporate some of that in there. And then I did want to head south. Um, yeah. I, I was in Madrid a couple of years ago. I liked that. And then I was going to head south along that mm -hmm. eastern yeah. uh, coastal line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, all right. Well, we're here to talk to Shakespeare. So um, we can make it all about Spain. I'm cool with that. I'm... No, 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 no. We, we, <laughs> we, I, I, that's false advertising. So I advertise Shakespeare. So. <laughs> we're talking to Shakespeare. About we're, we're talking Shakespeare. Gosh darn it. Um, OK, so. <laughs> um, all right. So we let introduce I, I think probably like people who are on this call know who you are and the the general people who are tutor con people know who you are but this is going to go out to my podcast and not everybody knows who you are so tell me who you are hi everyone i am dan Castellic. i play your friendly neighborhood shakespeare at renaissance festivals and schools and libraries and your random mass birthday party um, <laughs> all over uh the east coast of the united states so and a little further inland as well. So we, I do New York and New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Delaware, Virginia, Maryland, Louisiana, Florida, kind of skip the uh, Carolinas a bit, but yeah, um, it, it is great. I've been doing it for 15 years now. Uh, one man audience interactive improvisational Shakespeare show that I call Shakespeare Approves because I'm Will Shakespeare. And I improve of this message, <laughs> which Very always cool. gets a bigger laugh in non-election years. Election right. years, people are like, "Please don't say that." <laughs> so sick of hearing it. So sick of hearing it. Um, that's funny. All right, so we have a couple of things we are going to talk about today, including authorship questions. Oh yeah, uh, mysteries and uh, the sonnets so that kind of goes along with authorship questions. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the sonnets and who wrote the sonnets and all of that. Whether Marlowe was a spy, because I think that's fun. And also, mm. I didn't email you this, but it 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 kind of came to my head about 20 minutes ago that given the time of year it is, we should talk a little bit about Macbeth and witches and James the first and witchcraft. I don't know if you can talk about any of that. We oh, I can it. talk about, I, this, 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 is, this is stuff I like to dive deep on. Awesome. And Wikipedia and YouTube are my friends for like rabbit holes. Like yeah. one thing that coronavirus has been amazing to me, um, it's been a, a wonderful boon in as much that because I am self-employed, I have lots of random time on my hands now, and I can fall down Wikipedia rabbit holes that will take me from breakfast time until way after dinner, and I'm just going down it. And sometimes my wife will jump in the rabbit hole with me, and she's like, "What you doing?" And I will watch videos and read articles together. And sometimes she's just like, "Okay, you have fun." And you have fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna you know live my life <laughs> I'm like, yeah, all right yeah, yeah. cool oh no i really need to i really need to learn more about uh okay. why they changed uh monetary units it, it's a fast it's just like <laughs> why i don't know for a joke <laughs> the change of the calendar <laughs> like it's yeah just like, that's fun. like let's yeah oh change of calendar like let's make jokes uh about um being uh secret uh catholics inside right. of england so it's just like mm, i'm not gonna listen to your calendar i'm so i'm gonna try to avoid eating meat at this point on 
meatless Fridays, but yeah, um, okay. <laughs> and and like, that was oh before God. they had any kind of like um, vegan burgers and stuff, so you couldn't like sneak a meatless <laughs> burger, right? Now you can. Oh just my gosh! Oh, can I say Boca Burgers, Impossible Burgers, etc.? Yeah. Those are such a boon to my personal lifestyle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because oh man, I can go out to eat. I can go to Red Robin with people. And it's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the let's talk a little bit about the authorship question. So why is there a mystery around Shakespeare's plays? There's why, not. Okay. <laughs> so why why are there so many books <laughs> about people who are saying that there's a mystery around Shakespeare's plays? Um, like, talk, and I mean, I think that. Because like, how can one person and I have written not have this knowledge like, okay, and I guess when I say authorship, I also mean like, these lost years of his between when he was in Stratton and sure. when he shows up in London and like, what was he doing? And how did he get knowledge from like shipping and like Greeks and tragedy okay. and like Italy and like how how it does that lead to the questions about who he really was talk? Sure, sure. absolutely. <laughs> um, and on that and on that, I also question uh, the authorship of every single Stephen King book. Okay. because of the same reason how can one person be so prolific um the reason that there is a question or um a controversy or anything is because people are elitist okay. and oh this guy who is a glover's son from uh warwickshire uh he he can't possibly have written all of this stuff he can't possibly have knowledge whereas a lot of the uh, expert knowledge that you see demonstrated in the plays is surface level only. It's, mm -hmm. I heard a conversation between two barristers talking about a law case. And so, oh, I have a little bit of knowledge of the law. Oh, I heard a conversation between a few sailors. And so we're going to talk about the seashore of Italy or to yell yar <laughs> in, in Tempest. Uh, we're going to, I mean, his geography is wrong. His his knowledge of sailing in the law and courts, surface level, or maybe a little bit deeper at times because he'll know people who know people who know people. It's like, oh, well, you know, one time I had a friend who had a cousin whose aunt worked for the queen's maid. <laughs> it's just like, oh, oh wow. <laughs> Obviously this is deep inside knowledge. Right. But everybody, doesn't want to say that it could just be a Glover's son from Stratford in the middle of Warwickshire who could do this. Uh, someone who grew up in the now burgeoning middle class of England, but was not a gentleman, was not uh, university educated, um, was not in the circles of court. And so it has to be, obviously. Edward de Vere or Francis Bacon or Christopher Marlowe using a pseudonym or Queen Elizabeth Regina Gloriana herself because she's got nothing else to do other like is while that a theory a I haven't heard that one. Oh yeah that's one wow. <laughs> and so um uh especially since the movie uh Anonymous came out several years ago mm. um I like signing tweets and just random things uh some every once in a while hashtag suck it Derek Jacobi <laughs> because yes he is a brilliant Shakespearean actor and director mm -hmm. but he is a proponent of the Oxfordian theory that it was Edward de Vere yeah. the Earl of Oxford who wrote all of yeah. this and it's not look at de Vere's published works they s they're not good um <laughs> they're, uh, and also he died way before uh, about half of the plays were done. Mm. Um, and so it's like, well, his son-in-law was involved. And so like oh. you start creating a wider conspiracy around that there's all these different nobles um, and gentry working on the plays of Shakespeare. But that just doesn't really uh, fit in with Occam's Razor because the entire conspiracy would have fallen apart. It's just like simplest thing being what it is, it was this relatively uneducated um kid from uh the midlands yeah who listened and that's what actors and writers do they listen to people 
and start uh, extrapolating from there. Gotcha. And also, uh, the equivalent of an eighth grade education, which is what Shakespeare had in that period, was really freaking high. It was, I mean, maybe not a university level education that we would have now, but at the very least taking you up to uh, was probably the equivalent of um, a full-on high school uh, education for the period. And you spent a lot of time reading the classics, reading, mm -hmm. um, um, doing your numbers, learning basic world history and geography. So sure. he'd have at least um, a primer level of And it would be more, what. I mean, I suspect it would be even more in some ways deeper than what an eighth grade education would be now because he's reading yeah. in Latin and he's learning foreign languages in ways that we don't and translating and things. And you're learning the stuff by rote as well. Mm -hmm. It's when he's when he's learning Ovid, he's learning to quote Ovid. It's not mm -hmm. just, oh, I can kind of read it in a little bit of Latin, like little Latin, less Greek, maybe for speaking mm -hmm. purposes, but also being able to do the translations for it. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that most school children would have known. And saying most school children isn't saying like, oh yeah, every kid in America nowadays. Right. Most school children largely meant boys mm -hmm. and the grouping of people was not wide. It right. Was, um, uh, Shakespeare's father at one point was a town magistrate uh, uh, ha and uh, having um, a position in town um, for Stratford, roughly equivalent to uh, that of a mayor nowadays. So he, they, the family was of some means and he and his siblings were able to go to school his sister, uh, Joanna, did not, as far as we can tell, but probably had some private tutelage at home, if only from her, her brothers, saying, well, here's how you read this and all that. Mm -hmm. Now, we know his wife, Anne Hathaway, no real education uh, to speak of, but his daughters did have it. So mm -hmm. this was a family of means. This was a family who did go to school. Right. And I wanted to ask you about his early life, too, because I've heard um, the this tantalizing idea that he was at the Robert Dudley's 1575 Kenilworth mm, yeah. last ditch effort to have Queen Elizabeth marry him. So what can you tell me? Was that could that be? And do you know anything about that? So I, I do actually that's so funny that you mentioned that one. I do know a little bit about that from a wonderful book called Will in the World. Oh, yeah. so you know Steven, that book too. Stephen Greenblatt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's a yeah. great it's a it's a great biography. Yeah. Going on just the scant bits that we have, circumstantial evidence. But you know what? If the Oxfordians are allowed to use circumstantial evidence, so are the Stratfordians. <laughs> so let's do this. Um, Shakespeare would have been, uh, what, 11? At the time of going to uh, Dudley's uh, blowout and <laughs> getting, blowout. To, getting, to, getting to sing Queen Bess in all of her glory on a glory. Mm -hmm. She'd been on the throne, what, 20 years at that point? Yeah. Just the height of power. Um, you're going into the Gloriana period uh, the years just before the Spanish Armada coming to uh, face off against the minuscule English Navy. And Shakespeare got to see spectacle for the first time. Now, he'd probably seen theater, just roving bands of uh, players coming into town, as was the want, and we still do, uh, except this the year of uh, the Murder Hornets. Um, but... <laughs> Because that's the big thing, keeping us all home, right? Murder hornets. Right, the murder hornets, totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he saw spectacle, large, grandiose mm -hmm. for the first time. And this was spectacle that you would also not see in the theaters. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the fun things is, uh, just a weird coincidence, um, Dudley's uh, spectacle uh, for Queen Bess when she was on Progress coincided with the start of the first theaters in London. Um, purely coincidental uh, of the same time period, but they learned from each other of, oh, we can do that. Oh, that's neat. Great and Lester fun. had a troop of players, right? Yes. So. Um, mo most nobles did. Most nobles were the uh, sponsor, the patron 
of a group of players. So he had Lester's men, um, but there were also uh, troops that would come and go being the Queen's men, um, the Lord Chamberlain's players, uh, and so on. Like So Shakespeare's company was the Lord Chamberlain's, um, periodically the Lord Chamberlain's men, the Lord Chamberlain's players. They became the Queen's men, lost that after the death of Bess, and then regained it very quickly, becoming the King's men. Uh, so his company at the Globe, where he was a shareholder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so not uncommon. So uh, that uh, being a very uh, huge moment in a uh, period, I think that would have been talked about for years afterward of you have uh, this fantastic mermaid statue that's and didn't they have like musicians hidden under underground and or like under the water and then the, yes. they were like in the shell and then the shell opens up and there's like musicians there and it was oh like- yeah you had you had mechanical production happening of a a siren coming out of the water out of this man-made lake that he had made for the purpose yeah. um of the queen coming to his house yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. With fountains coming out of it, as you said, the clamshell opening, musicians hidden in spaces under uh, water. So elaborate, so dangerous for the time as well. I mean, that's dangerous to do now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it just, it and it was, yes, it was for the queen, but everyone had to be there because yeah. this had to get talked about and, and not just so- by the noble classes. I'm going to interrupt you for a second just to like Absolutely, get back on why well, no, but why he might have been there. So he might have been there because Kenilworth was what like nine miles or something from. Yeah, it was. It wasn't even like a day's walk. It was a couple hours, a couple hours yeah. walk. And if you took a cart or a horse, you could be there probably in an hour. And his father, having been a magistrate, might have had some role in planning. Um, if not in the actual planning, um, being members uh being a member of the uh local um um hoity toities <laughs> right. let's say okay. of okay. like oh well uh here here's the magistrate of uh of stratford your majesty and just going through the receiving line of course yes right. hello hello yes elbow right. elbow wrist wrist um would would will have met her no right. <laughs> but right, right, right. would his his father quite probably mm. and even though they were in theory um uh died in the wool catholics because of uh her sister mary at the same point uh every indication um is led to believe that his father was incredibly loyal to the concept of just the monarchy and like we're not going to be catholics that uh, raise up against her um so and his father had a just just fun side tangent on that um his father um would not go to church and we have that in records because his father would get fined for not going to church because you know no separation of church and state right but so, and some people say well that's be- that shows that they were catholic not necessarily it also shows that his father had debt right. <laughs> and just like okay. oh no if i go they can find me right. <laughs> it's like oh they, they can catch me <laughs> so just not go because the rest yeah. of the family would go <laughs> Like, oh, we're not going to find Mrs. Shakespeare, just Mr. Shakespeare. Okay, because I have heard that that they might have been Catholics because of that, but you don't think that that's... Um, I mean, it's it's one of those coin flips. It could go either way because lots of people would avoid going to church because they couldn't afford to pay the tithes that were at set amounts. It wasn't just like dropping a few coins. It was at set percentages that you had to do it. So was the fine higher than to not, the fine was less than the tithe was? Um, no, the fine was higher, but it just like reached this point of like, oh, I, I didn't go for so long. And now I, I have, it's, it's basically just turn, like you see a police car ahead and you have outstanding parking tickets. And it's so gotcha. many at this point of, right. well, if the police don't catch me, I don't lose my driver's license. <laughs> so gotcha. I don't go to church. They don't put me in jail or charge me a lot of money right so the bills are stacking up i uh, see i'm just gonna avoid you and so like his father left public life um mm-hmm. was no longer a town magistrate uh there's some uh documentary evidence of shakespeare paying off lots of debts for his father um as he in the late 1590s as he started getting um 
uh, more successful, more money. Um, he pursued the coat of arms uh, for the family to be um, moved into gentry. Uh, his father didn't actually get to see that. His father died before that happened. But um, his children got to bear the uh, rank of gentle. So nice. For, for a brief period. Good for them. I'm yeah. sure that was <laughs> nice for them. Um, okay. And so does the question, oh, so then I, I also, I have a question about these lost years. Like, mm -hmm. so what can you tell me about, so there's this, I, there's like a period where he just goes missing, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I beg your pardon. Oh no. Uh, you're, yeah. <laughs> so you're talking from between the births, uh, but, um, after the birth of the twins mm -hmm. until, you have the first uh, published works and all that. Right. Um, the best evidence as someone who believes in the, Shakespeare is the author of his own stuff, is that he was a working actor on the road. He okay. took up with a playing company when they came through town and not w necessarily wanting to be a country rustic, having the wanderlust saying, this is the job for me and I can completely and totally relate on my own yeah sure <laughs> um he went out on a theater with a theater company because it was the best way for him to make money for him and his now growing family he has three kids all all small he's not even 21 years old <laughs> and he might not be completely in love with his wife given that oh. she was older and pregnant when they got married right yeah so yeah. it might be a fun escape yeah, a fun and a fun joke I always say is the kids aren't even mine, which is a, a, which is the thing that people always say. Right. Like, oh, those aren't my kids. Yeah. But um, I like to take uh, as a joke um, the whole concept that uh, Christopher Marlowe is, you know, um, the author of Shakespeare, uh, or one of the potential. I say, no, 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 he's not. He, no, it, those are my plays. Those plays are my children. Now, my children my are not. his. Actually, no, my actual <laughs> physical kids. Those are his. No, those are Marlowe's right. kids. Yeah. Right. Just right. playing with uh, fun silliness yeah. of just turn it on its head. But okay. yeah, uh, lots of evidence that it was lust that drove him and Anne together. And then uh, when reality set in, it was, oh boy. Yeah. I'm uh, 18, 19 years old. Don't really know what I'm doing yet. Now, granted, you are in the eyes of the law fully a grown up at that point, but no one is going to take it. A 19 year old seriously doing much of anything right, um, right. and he hit okay. the bricks and so he, when he... you talk about traveling players coming through that this is the period like you said when theaters were just getting started tell me about this um this kind of tran or movement i i don't my mind is losing itself right now this movement from like traveling players and the medieval versions of like these hmm. christmas plays and things like that sure. to the theater and we're in this period of transition with that right now right yeah. so yes exactly so the very first uh theater in um in england was the theater the theater right yes <laughs> Truth so in advertising. <laughs> owned by Burbage. Owned by um uh I think I think they have the same first name. Uh Richard Burbage. It might have been Edward. I'm losing that, but Burbage's father, Burbage, the famous actor who worked with Shakespeare, it was his father. He was the guy. He was the imprimatur producer of theatricals in London. Now, uh getting up to that point, you had traveling players. You had touring companies. Um so hey, we're doing spam a lot. Great, send it on the road. We're doing whatever. So at this point, um, we're doing, um, uh, we're gonna do uh, every man. <laughs> we're gonna send it on the road, and we're gonna do a mummers, uh, some mummers show, or we're gonna do um, this Christmas pageant. And you had um, this the fifteen uh, the fifteen hundreds up. So basically, the entire Tudor period was the point of you see the morality plays start to get good. You go from every man uh, and you have narrators just uh, talking people through dumb show into a point of actors now declaiming their own lines mm -hmm. into now wholly original works getting done. And this is where you see the people immediately presaging Shakespeare coming in. And it's not great, but for the period, it is 
It is something else. It is something that people had never seen before. Oh, this is an original story. This is this is amazing. You start seeing uh, history plays happen. You start seeing more elaborate versions of the Passion of the Christ, um, or uh, the Christmas story, as um, we had mentioned, and being performed in town squares. Usually, like you would have a, a wagon that would, like have parts um, collapse off of it and you start building up your stage. Sometimes you get to go into a town hall or a great lord's house or just like a local landed gentry's house. They would have a great hall. Invite sometimes just their friends, the entire town, the whole countryside in. You'd play for a night. You'd play for a weekend. You'd play for a week. Mm -hmm. Kind of just like touring companies now. Each of the great lords was the sponsor starting in around the 1530s of a roving band of players because... It looked good. You are a proponent of the arts. This goes back all the way um, uh, into uh, the reign of King um, Richard II. Richard II was a huge sponsor of the arts, oh, specifically wow. with a with some up and comer named Geoffrey Chaucer. <laughs> right, of course. Okay. Going back yeah. to royal patronage of the arts at, in England at that point. Go forward. Everybody's doing it because everybody wants to do what the king or the queen does. And as an actor, as a troupe of actors, you would want to have this sponsorship to make yourself more legit, right? Yes. Like, so you could go into it is, town and... Yes, because there are roving bands of actors that don't have sponsorship. They also have less money. You, They pay less well. Um, they don't have as good of reputations. And they're also the ones who will do the more scandalous plays. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, oh, we have women in our company. It's just no. like... What? <gasps> There were actually yeah. women at like. Oh yeah, there were real? women playing. There were women playing yeah. women, and they were, and some of them were so heavily done up in order to potentially look like a man playing a woman. So right. there are women playing dressed a man. as a man. Yeah, playing a woman. Which then, oh. once you once you get into the actual Shakespearean period, you have um, men playing women, but then men playing women playing men. Right. <laughs> just right. Like, it's like let's just keep going with this and right of course okay. we don't get to the first uh legal and legitimate actresses on stage until uh the 1660s in the uh restoration period but yeah that's out that's outside of our of our purview right now sure. um so yeah the touring companies um were massively important because it brought people culture brought people um literature to an extent it gave people entertainment there's no uh there's no local theater company that you get to go see on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Theater as a concept of go out to go to go to the theater is a future concept or rather a long in the past concept of the Greeks and the Romans. Mm -hmm. But it came to England because of uh, Commedia dell'arte. Mm -hmm. um, the Italian um, the Italian uh, players all booked it out of Italy. <laughs> and a lot of uh, Europe in uh, the late Middle Ages because of plague. Okay. And they get to England, they don't speak the language, but they can play things large, broad, and in silly pantomime. And that's where, and they started wearing, um, and they had always um, done masks, but they start using more of them and making them even more comical than ever before in order to um, cross the language barriers. And that, and that um, became a lot of the basis for many of the roving theatrical companies that would go throughout the countryside and then also play in the great houses um, of the uh, nobility. And then one of them, they got together enough money to build a, to build a, their own playhouse, the theater. Mm -hmm. um, the next one was the curtain followed by the rose. And by the 1570s, by the late 1570s, you have a thriving theater ecosystem in London where all of the companies would also do road shows, sometimes out of sheer necessity because, oh, it's plague season plague in London, season. let's, let's get out of town. Um, um, but also to make more money. Mm -hmm. um, you, would try you would try stuff out in the sticks. If it's working out there, bring it back to London and also vice versa. Mm. And so I'm so interested about this whole, the rise of the theaters and how um, the, they had to be outside the city limits, right? Because mm -hmm. I, the, this was Puritans rising and eventually leading to the English Civil War and shutting it all down. And oh yeah, all yeah, that. yeah, yeah, because yeah. Puritans, no fun. Right. 
Exactly. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, and so speaking of Puritans now, happy yeah. Halloween. Let's burn some witches. Why not? And then you're taking me to Macbeth, but I don't want to go there yet because that's a little bit later. So I yeah, do want to talk about the, th yeah, 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 just a little bit. So I do want to talk about the theater because yeah. the specific theater, not the the, the, the theater in general, but the, the theater, because was that the one that they had to tear down and they rolled across the river? Can you tell me that story? Yeah. All right. So okay. uh, this actually, um, it happened uh, multiple times. So Shakespeare, the more famous one is Shakespeare's Globe. Mm -hmm. They owned the actual, so I'll tell you that one first in order mm -hmm. to tell you the, the older one. Okay. Shakespeare's Globe in the 1590s um, was on the north side of the Thames, um, outside of the city limits, and the city limits were basically the old Roman wall um, portion of the city. So you're London, but you're not London. Now right. like Westminster, of course, is London. So is yes, London. of course. So they owned the building, but not the land. And in, and in order to uh, get uh, shut down, in order to shut them down, uh, the uh, masters of the rebels and uh, members of uh, puritanical members of parliament were like, you know what? We're going to put pressure on this landowner. Uh huh. The theater company gets word of it, takes it down. The river is at this moment frozen solid. Because it's Christmas time. They skated across. They skated across the river, tear the whole thing down. Yeah. put it on a piece of land that they bought in Suffolk and start putting it back up. Now, they didn't put it all back up in one night, but they took enough of it down. Yeah. And, and the landlord across, was like, the no, way. It is, the landlord was like at his country house, right? And like yeah. didn't know that so this was going. No yeah. one was able to do anything. Yeah. And right. they had already bought land. They were going to open another theater That's on so the great. south side of the river. But just like, you know what? We're just moving it. That's we're not so dealing awesome. with this. You're not going to shut us down. And since we were are now since South since Southwark was considered not the city of London at all, it's the sketchy side of the river. We're going to be over there, and that's where basically uh, the original version of the West End <laughs> all started. Because you then have the Rose, the Curtain, the Globe, the Theater, um, so many others in that section of town that's where you had the bear baiting pit and the cockfighting um and that's also where the houses of ill repute were and things oh like that. most of, but with very good reputations <laughs> <laughs> to quote shakespeare in love um yeah that's where all of that was and partly why uh acting continued to have such a terrible reputation because right. you were next okay. to uh the houses of ill repute you were next to the public houses the taverns everything where everybody would go but the genteel members of society just wouldn't talk about it <laughs> and so they're not there um the theater went through a very um, similar situation they were they didn't go so far as to let's move it across the river but they did tear it down and rebuild it a few okay. blocks away uh, at another <laughs> outside of the city limits. And yeah, so they would also be like up near Islington and stuff too, right? It wasn't just like, it was just kind of outside as long as you Yeah, it, it was, you just needed to, because the legal bans of the city right. were so determined. So, oh, all right, I just need to go six blocks that way. Okay. Catch, done. So like Blackfriars, which was the first indoor theater in um, in England, owned by Shakespeare's company and was able, had the virtue of being able to now be indoors, I mean, and thus year round, was outside of the city gates. They were by the Blackfriars gate, but outside of the city, they were on the, I think on the Westminster side. And okay. so, uh, and then, but by that point, it was the theaters were thriving and no one was really pushing against them. Um, not for another 20 some years would it become a problem. Okay. And so we've got Shakespeare. He's probably a traveling player. And um, then, and then he shows up in London, uh, probably having worked his way up through the, through the player ranks. And yeah. now he's like, and okay. Like offering a rewrite to a line here. Oh, let's mm -hmm. change this line. Oh, Hey, I'm, I've been working on something. Can you let me slip it in? So you're writing stuff. Maybe going anywhere from just writing some scenes to I'm going to write a, sm a whole short play. So you have uh, early ones. You have uh, the second part of King Henry VI, fun history. You, It was the only one he written, wrote at the time. Yeah, wrote. It was the only part he had written at the time. So it was just King Henry VI. Uh, 
but you also have Titus Andronicus, which is not good. <laughs> but it is fun, and it was exactly what Elizabethan audiences wanted to see. It was gory, it had action, it had revenge, it had onstage fights, it had it all. And it had some of the first well-written women on the English stage. And they were well-written women, even though women weren't allowed on stage, because, well, uh, this um, younger uh, male actor who can play a woman or um, this actor with a higher voice or whatever, this really terrific actor, let's see what Ned Allen can do, for instance. Yeah. You want to give them some juicy material, otherwise they're going to maybe leave the company. Sure. And you need it to be a draw. So that's why Shakespeare's women tend to be so well drawn out. <laughs> um, because you have men playing it. And so it was a sexist reason. Right. But you end up with characters who are still beautifully well written today. Yeah. No, I... I... I can tell that. And uh, so, okay, so here he is, he's now writing. And mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to this whole idea of the traveling players too, because oh, yeah. that that takes me to the idea I've of spies. I've lived that life, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so let me talk, let, let's talk about spies for a minute because um, musicians made good spies. Any of these people who could like slip in to a town and, mm -hmm. and, you know, start talking to people seem to make good spies. So Marlowe, spy. Shakespeare. Yeah, spy? totally. Yeah. Shakespeare, not a spy. Marlowe, totally a spy. Totally spy. <laughs> okay. And Marlowe's death, like spy related or just random drunken brawl? Oh, I'm, I, I, I am totally in favor of the random drunken brawl. Really? I don't have, I don't have evidence for it. I don't think it was some cloak and dagger thing. I think a dagger was involved, but no cloak. I love the idea of I'm not paying this and right? then like okay. slipping and stabbing himself because I know people that stupid. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, okay. But um, Marlo being a spy, yeah, absolutely. I think we have some good documentary right. evidence for that. He worked for Francis Walsingham. Um, he right. uh, actually traveled to the continent um, a handful of times. And he dies at, what, 29, 30 years old? So yeah. really young. Um, but he was in there. Shakespeare, I don't think so, because he had such an eye on the business side of the theater world. Mm -hmm. And he really was trying to make money. Now, and that's not to say he couldn't have uh, been an agent. Um, it, maybe that's also where he got some uh, cash, where it's like, hey, are you really making money at this theater business? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he got it from Burley or uh, <laughs> Walsingham's, uh, Walsingham's uh, boys getting him some yeah. cash. So yeah. uh, there's, a fun, there's a really fun uh, novel uh, on the possibility of Shakespeare being a spy. Um, it's by Harry Turtledove. It's an alternate history. The uh, entire idea is what if the Spanish Armada in 1588 was successful oh, wow. and landed in England. Elizabeth That's gets like uh, taken hostage and is in the Tower of London. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, everything else kind of keeps going forward because life is going to go on. It's just going to be different. So Shakespeare and Marlowe are both actors and writers for the English stage. Oh. The Catholics haven't ruled it out. In fact, they're like, oh, this is great. We have Lope de Vega. We're going to bring him over. <laughs> oh, and wow. Marlowe and Shakespeare at the same time get recruited by Burley, who is no longer Lord Burley because they did away with a lot of the, the Spanish did away with a lot of uh, the nobles who <laughs> had power. But it's like, oh, you have money. So, um, yeah. So, uh, how fun. They, and what's get, they, Harry they get Turtles brought up? in. I got to look this up. Harry Turtle Dove. The book is called Ruled Britannia. Ruled Britannia, okay. It is a page turner, and they bring in, he brings in such wonderful use of Shakespearean dialogue. Okay. Um, so in prose, uh, specifically oh, through um, the one constable gets brought in a lot, and is basically uh, modeled on Dogberry from Much Ado mm. About Nothing. It is brilliantly done. There's and, another book I thought you were going to mention that I just read called The King of the Edge of the World by Arthur Phillips. Have you read that one? I have not. What's that? That um, focuses on the James coming and it has Marlowe being a spy and it's it's a really long and convoluted story, but it's it's a, a, another spy, Elizabethan theater, Shakespeare spy story. Okay. Too. So anyway, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, no, uh, I, Marlo not totally business. is. Yeah, yeah. Shakespeare's <laughs> totally on the business side of it. I mean, he was a very litigious person, suing people, getting sued all the time up until his uh, final year of life. Um, okay. Yeah, he was interested in landowning. He was, if he was a spy, I think he I moved away from that relatively um, early on. Okay. Um, at least by the at least by. Um, maybe not that early but um at least by the age of 40 <laughs> when you see him okay. really getting into a uh, um ownership and um becoming a landlord and things like that interesting getting really litigious over grain <laughs> why not Be yeah just like hey i'm gonna do that right okay uh, so, all right. So then, because it's Halloween time, I want to mm -hmm. I want to move us to witchcraft and Macbeth and James the. Thank first. you for Can saying we... the name, by the way. Oh, what what name? Do you, what do you mean? Oh, you people that? avoid it like the plague, oh. and I mean often just in the theater world. But you see so many more people just go oh, the Scottish play, and oh it's right, like, okay. Oh, come on. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that I was doing a thing there. Okay. Nice oh, no, 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 no. You made me very happy. That okay. Is, uh, I'm an actor who says break a leg. I'm an actor who, um, uh, for also very um, logical reasons, you don't uh, walk onto a darkened stage. You make sure there's a ghost light on. I mean, that's not just a superstition. That's also just plain so safety. So you don't trip. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's just good safety. Right. But saying the name of McBee, I have, I disagree with fully, and I'm going to catch so much hate <laughs> for saying that. Okay. Like, no, say it, say it, say it three times. Summon him, Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. 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 Uh, like okay. treat him like Beetlejuice, or maybe don't. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> all right, no, it's it's. I, I I find it a silly superstition that I've never been able to get on board with. It. How fun. But so fun to make fun of. How fun. I had no idea that this was a thing in the theater. So that's Oh, that's wow. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I it is know. a it is a cursed play because someone got hurt sometime. And obviously, it was the fault of the play. And thus, you can't say the name of the play unless you're actively performing it, right. especially if you're in a theater, um, the actual building of it. And it's just like, oh, God. <sighs> So it's like Voldemort or something too. Yeah, okay. it's the play that shall not be named. No, right. come on. Okay, so let's talk about that then, because so this was when James the First was newly to the throne, and mm -hmm. he had a he had a thing about witches. He um, loved the occult. He 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 loved writing books about them and blaming them for his wife's shipwreck and all of that kind of stuff, right? So so talk to me about talk to me about that because this is it's it's this time of year. King Jimmy, I mean, oh, first of that guy, that guy was, that guy was a barrel of Looney Tunes, wasn't he? I mean, oh, I mean, first off, I don't, I do not uh, endorse his upbringing at all. I mean, your no. mother, your mother's imprisoned when you are a baby and mm -hmm. you are named the king and you're raised by abusive people and, yeah. and oh gosh, and then yeah, your mother gets time. killed by your cousin. You're uh, bound to be messed up after that. Absolutely. Um, you are, I mean, and, and, and you are closeted homosexual, but not closeted because like, as soon as he became king of England, it's like, oh, we're playing it out here in the open. Oh, no, 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 I'm not gay. This just happens to be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's not my lover. Totally right. wink. But it's just like, right. wait, what? Come on. Sure. Um, he fun guy. Um, <laughs> so he so messed a, up, and I love him. So he does a bit of projection, um, and I, I think mm -hmm. a lot of which that is stuff. Huh? Which is are responsible for everything, right? <laughs> okay. And so, why? How did Shakespeare get in? Like, what was the? Why did he write Macbeth? Tell me about why Shakespeare suddenly got the witches, got bitten by the witches um, right. fever. Why? So, tell me about that. Number one, witches are fun. Number two, uh, <laughs> um, it is even though it is a history play, it is just let's just have a romp of a good time. We're going to tell a story. It's to an extent a ghost story, and it's fun and silly um king james as we've already uh, established here in love with the occult if only like he loved to hate the occult but he was obsessed with it 
he, uh, like, as you said, he blamed witches for his wife's shipwreck. <laughs> it's just like, And didn't he what? actually go to, like, watch some of them being questioned and, like, do uh -huh. the questioning himself yeah. and stuff? Like yeah, that. he, yeah. um, he <laughs> would, was probably beloved by, um, uh the 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 witch uh the witch finder army in uh right. good omens okay. um, <laughs> but shakespeare writes it to get in good with the king this is around the period of becoming the king's men and he writes a play where it takes place in the king's home country mm -hmm. it involves one of the great supposed villains of scotland it blames witches for everything and through a convoluted series of events, um, the king's own family uh, come out on top. What's not to love? Yeah, so uh, the king's uh, family um, claiming descent originally from Banquo, um, okay. Macbeth's uh, best friend who he then has murdered, um, and then showing how Macbeth is ruled by women, and James, in addition to being um, obsessed with witches, um, and uh, flamingly homosexual uh, was incredibly misogynistic and mm -hmm. did not like women <clears throat> like, uh, for anything other than let's make a baby, get the next generation going. He did mm -hmm. not like women, although he apparently had a really good relationship with his daughter, Sophia. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, or rather, I'm sorry, his daughter, Elizabeth, okay. but was not, uh, was not a fan. And so Lady Macbeth is the, um, um, the witches get, set everything in motion, and then Lady Macbeth is the main villain mm -hmm. of Macbeth. Macbeth is just kind of a patsy going along for the ride. Um, so it kind of played into all of the king's um, obsessions um, and or likes. And that, did this work for Shakespeare? Was he successful with this? Oh, it was one of the most popular plays of the period. Oh. Uh, um, so much that it spawned... Uh, spawned uh, copies <laughs> there were several uh several ripoffs of it over over the years and continue to be but it was a huge financial success for him both from patronage from the king but also uh just people paying their penny to come see the show wow. it was it was incredibly popular uh, most of the plays would uh rotate out and mm -hmm. they'd come back a year or two or three later Macbeth, from when they started performing in, I, th I want to say 1605, 1603, somewhere okay. in that somewhere in that zone, um, to Shakespeare's death in 1616, never stopped performing. It would just wow. it would happen all the time. Um, other that's theater... like Hamilton level success. Yeah, it, it it was it was great. It's like it was Macbeth now and forever, just like cats. Um, it's like, we're never going to close this show. It's the Fantastics, the longest running show on Broadway. Um, it, it is, it was, um, so incredibly popular because it had everything. It had, it had fights, it had witches, it had magic on stage and it came with its spectacle. Um, they had, um ghosts on stage rising out and the stage directions are clear rising up out of the cauldron so they had to use uh the trap doors and um early uh, mechanisms in order to get everything to work and be appropriately so cool. spooky oh yeah imagine been so cool. being oh uh, one of the groundlings so you're standing there yeah. at ground level the stage is at chester shoulder height for you yeah. and you all of a sudden start seeing somebody rise up out of the floor that had to have blown your mind even yeah. if you intellectually yeah. understand how it works that had to just be like oh my god that's amazing yeah, yeah, yeah especially yeah, yeah. if they're coming out of the cauldron oh so great that's awesome okay so we have chatted on a lot of different subjects here oh all over the uh, place this yeah. is just a normal conversation with me no i, I go love everywhere. it everywhere I love it. It's great. I have one more. I want to go one more place for you. And then my daughter has kindly reminded me that I told her I would be done in about 45 minutes or so. And that was six minutes ago. So she's <laughs> telling me that. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, she needs attention. She's telling me she's seven. So um, oh, she's very clear in her demand. You are correct, small person. <laughs> um, anyway, so, okay. So did sonnets, 
I've heard all kinds of stuff about the sonnets, that oh, who they were yeah. written for, who they were written by. Mary Sidney Herbert wrote them, but then not, and then they were first. Out. So tell just the Mary real Sydney, brief. Mary Sidney Herbert wrote sonnets, just her own. Yeah, not <laughs> Shakespeare's. Okay, not Shakespeare's. No, Shakespeare's sonnets were all written by Shakespeare. There's a couple that they a while back they were attributing to him, just because it was really in vogue to. Oh, here's something new we found. Must be Shakespeare's. Mm -hmm. It's like. Um, okay. They started off as uh, uh, they started off as you know uh, custom orders. Um, he was hired to write sonnets for uh, Henry Wriothesley, um, uh, a young earl, um, partly to like build him up. He was eighteen ish at the time. Shakespeare was about thirty um, to encourage him to uh, follow his parents' wishes and get married and then there's some uh supposition that they themselves also <clears throat> had a romantic relationship going on shakespeare and the young earl and um there's a little bit of uh more than a little bit of love and a at least a little bit of uh erotic love thrown into that but then you see everything switch later um because they were written over a very long period of time right 15 20 years and his attention shifts to what we call the dark lady. The dark lady. Um, yeah. And that could have been a noble woman he was in love with. That could have, um, a lot of people think uh, that there was this one noble woman that he had a relationship with. Some people think that it was uh, a woman who worked at a tavern that he liked to go to. <laughs> and and just like they had a relationship. Either wow. way, it's a woman okay. he had a relationship yeah. with. Yeah. Um, but, um, they no, they um all uh, what one hundred and fifty four of them written by him, but just for different purposes for different reasons. Some of them they're obviously just a commission of my mom. To, um, your mom told me to write this to you. Okay. <laughs> it's just like okay, um, you can create a little bit of a running dialogue with them, of you can fill in the blanks of, uh, what um the young Earl says in between <laughs> sonnets oh. like oh. Don't listen to my mother. Well, I'm gonna write you another one. <laughs> Don't listen to that either. Well, let 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 me write us really fam this one that's gonna become really famous. Number eighteen. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Which is purely to say, you are awesome. You are beautiful. There's no one in this world who wouldn't love you. And oh my gosh, I'm gonna fade away, but you are great. Like oh, I'm haggard. I'm thirty. Um, <laughs> but you, oh, you're. You're uh, your eternal summer. You're good. At, nothing about you is going to fade. You are forever. Um, and then as long as this poem lasts, your beauty will be remembered. And then uh, you get into the exact opposite of that uh, with 116 uh, further down the line um, about what is the nature of love? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when an alteration finds or bends with remover to remove. It's an ever fixed mark. And mm -hmm. That just says love can be constant. It <clears throat> it, it goes really beautifully uh, with um, the Psalms, where love is patient, love is kind, mm -hmm. love uh, brooks no, um, <clears throat> love is not envious, love. Um, uh, I'm losing a lot of it, a lot of the thread there, but it, it's almost like a of a piece with that, and that right there is also one of the reasons because of sonnet 116 why some people say shakespeare may have been one of the scholars and poets hired to do the king james bible all uh, right <laughs> because okay. styles matching up <laughs> i'm going sure hmm. and then some people look for like the hidden meanings of like oh you go to what was it uh psalm 47 go to the 47th line <laughs> it's like you're gonna find this word find shake and then go and find spear later and like oh obviously oh and right. just like no just look at styles <laughs> <laughs> okay but, all right yeah shakespeare so, sonnets beautiful and i love them all right awesome awesome <laughs> and um so if people have any questions um just go ahead and type them in and or um or chat them in or whatever um and that's or you could uh raise your hand too and i can call on you um but in the meantime that whole thing about the the psalms and the sonnets and stuff like that mary sydney herbert right. did that lyrical translation of the psalms too so it wasn't mm -hmm. particularly like unusual you say that that means people say that that means like he was involved in the king james translation like that was actually quite a common thing to do is do some of these like lyrical translations of things it really stuff. is it really was it was in, in a, it was a very in vogue intellectual exercise for 
active working poets and playwrights to do, but also people who would dabble. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, my daughter's got that too. Okay. Perfect. Uh, no, he just coughed. No, that's, she's back here coughing like a, yeah. So that's fine. Um, awesome. Okay. So there she just went. Um, uh, oh, so <laughs> as we say, as we would say in the Renaissance, plague be gone. Plague be gone. Yes. Plague be gone. Um, I don't see any questions popping up. Um, you are awesome. So where oh, thank can you. people, so, are you. <laughs> so where can people find out more about you and like buy your stuff and, okay, and book cool. you for parties and <laughs> fairs and various entertainments? All right. Well, you can just uh, simply go to my <clears throat> website, shakespeareapproves.com. Uh, so that's Shakespeare spelled uh, the most traditional way, S-H-A-K-E-S-P-E-A-R-E, -E -E, approves.com, or go to Facebook, Shakespeare Approves, Instagram, Shakespeare.approves, Twitter, uh, Shakes Approves. I'm on Patreon if you just want to throw money at me, patreon.com slash Shakespeare. Um, so I'm everywhere right now. Mm -hmm. I, and during this uh, age of uh, the murder hornets and UFOs being real, mm -hmm. Uh, you have to be everywhere right now because we're not allowed to go out. So right. sure. you want me to do a show in Spain. I will do a show in Spain from my living room. And that's a promise. <laughs> Awesome. I, I believe you would. Um, now, you know, it's you'd have the murder hornets here. Here in, in Spain, we had West Nile virus all summer, too. So, oh, come you know, on. it's because it's 2020. Why not? So, um, 2020 is a swear word now. It really is. <laughs> 2021 going to get it? Uh, yeah, Hannah says Let's 2021 is going to be, yeah, be better. Your um, mouth to God's ears, kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your mouth to God's ears. No yeah, no coronavirus. Um, anyway, okay. So what else do I want to say to you? What did We got you to plug your stuff. You are awesome. Everybody should check you out. And um, and I, I have to say that your line in TudorCon that got the most uh, interest, I think, was when you said that this was the meeting of the nerds and there truly is no place nerdier than to you know be at Tudor. There's nothing else nerdy. Oh, here's a question. How many languages did Shakespeare speak? Probably just one. Okay. Um, with a working knowledge um, enough of French, but a lot of evidence that like when he uses French friend with Joan of Arc or um, uh, Princess Catherine in um, Henry V that other, someone else came in and fixed it. It's like, oh, I want to say this. And like, uh, so only actual functional English, but a um, little bit of, I um, mean, uh, yeah, a little bit of um, uh, French, some Latin. Um, like, what is it? Little Latin and less Greek. Um, he makes fun of himself in that in uh, Julius Caesar, where um, mm. um, they're talking about Caesar speaking with Cicero. He says, but for me, it was all Greek. It's all Greek to me. Yeah. Uh, just making fun of the fact that I don't speak it. Everyone knows it. I'm writing a joke. And 100 years from now, no one's going to know that I didn't know it. <laughs> so it's still a funny line. Awesome. Okay, so... I think we got everything here and it's been an hour and you've been so generous with your time and I am so oh, grateful to you. Thank so you my for, pleasure. So thank you for being at TudorCon. Um, I'm, I appreciate you taking this time now and then I'm going to put this out on my podcast there. We've got an applause um, coming up. So thank you so much. And um, oh, yeah, I, I live, I live, I live to hang out with my people, the nerds. I mean, like, th th this is great. I mean, if nothing else, coronavirus ha um, and the quarantine, hey, small person, um, <laughs> um, it, it has been good for the nerds finding each other, for us being able to say, let's all come together and really make use of this technology, glitchy as it is, in order to really come together and create and recreate and build new uh, communities of just like-minded people coming together for uh, Star Trek or Shakespeare or yeah. let's talk about Tudor history. I mean, like you want to go into the Wars of the Roses? Let's do that. I mean, yeah. I'll come back and talk your ear off about Richard the Second and all yeah, of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. All so, right, let's do that sometime. It's a great we'll come time. Come back and let's talk about the Wars of the Roses and and have fun with that sometime too. All we right. Will. Oh my gosh, awesome. so so great. And thank you for having me on. This is. A real pleasure. Oh, this is just such a pleasure for me too. Thank you so so much. Um, cool. Hannah, just a couple minutes. Okay, thank you so much, and I'll let you know when this goes out on my feeds and stuff too. And you're awesome. And Excellent. thank you.
All Thank right. you. You're awesome. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. <laughs>